Welcome to the Node Guardians podcast, where we discuss all things blockchain, decentralized web, smart contract programming, and cryptography. I am your host, Sam, and I am lucky to have with me today Daniel Lumi as a co-host, uh, a good friend and a researcher tackling all sorts of matters from zero knowledge to decentralizing sequencers. And our guest for today is Bo Du from Polymer Labs. Polymer Labs is trying to bring IBC to a blockchain near you. And uh, yeah, I think it's the first time that we get to, to have you on the podcast. So this is a pretty exciting time. Bo, it's a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, you know, thanks, thank you guys for having me. And uh, really excited to be here to talk about what Polymer is doing, IBC, because we're really excited about IBC and how we can bring IBC to other chains. Okay. Before start diving into all these um, all these things, it would be nice to know a little bit more about your background, how you ended up working in crypto, how the whole transition process happened for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my personal background prior to working in Web three uh, was on distributed systems and database systems. So I had spent some time working on an open source time series database called M three uh, at Uber, um, and also ended up leaving Uber to uh, start a company called Chronosphere. I joined them as the first hire, helped them scale their team, continue working on this open source time series database. Um, ended up leaving Chronosphere to start Polymer Labs. I spent some time moonlighting in the DeFi space. Uh, the story goes that I looked at any swaps source code. Uh, they're, they're now called multi-chain and a number of forks have been made on top of them since. And I realized that they were storing their transactions in MongoDB. And I was like, it doesn't get much more centralized than, than this for, for <laughs> transactions. Um, there has to be a better solution. Uh, we went down the path of exploring different protocols, became really excited about the idea of uh, inner blockchain communication protocol or, or IBC becoming this open source standard. Uh, and, and instead of uh, building yet another interop protocol standard, we decided to build IBC. Very cool, very cool. Could you timestamp that? When, when all of this did happen, was it when, um, you know, like the Cosmos Hub was being launched? Was it a little bit before, a little bit after, just so that we can get a little bit more context about the yeah. state of the technology when you started working in, in that space? Yeah, I'll say it was in 2021. Um, this was basically after DeFi summer, um, early 2021, where, you know, BSC had just come up. Um, any swap popped up because, you know, people wanted to start bridging tokens. And you had a number of other token bridges pop up uh, thereafter. And the exploration started uh, probably in the spring to the summer uh, and all the way into the winter. Um, I think over time, it wasn't that we found IBC and were like uh, immediately like, this is the right solution. We did spend some time exploring, uh, trying out alternatives, uh, looking at what other this were doing in this space. Um, but over time, we grew increasingly confident in IBC being, being that solution. Cool. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about your mission at Polymer, uh, what are you guys uh, mostly focused on at the moment, the, the challenges? Yeah, so I think first and foremost, uh, we want to make IBC the universal standard across all blockchains. There's been a quite a bit of work done on the open source side. Uh, as you guys have seen with our work on multi-hop IBC, uh, we're working on ex extending IBC or adapting IBC to work with modular blockchains right now. Um, there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, and then uh, in terms of the actual productized version of IBC that we're building or, or essentially a IBC hub uh, as, as Polymer, what, the goal there is to make it very easy for chains to integrate IBC since that's when one of the uh, major complaints about bringing IBC to other ecosystems is that it's in some cases it's, it's hard to do or almost impossible to do uh, natively on a particular chain. Okay, and so if I get it right, you're basically trying to prove uh, the interchain standard consensus mechanism being Tendermint on target chains, uh, which have different specs, right? <clears throat> so that's just the first step. Uh, I think there's yeah. some confusion in the space about IBC being just anything that has like clients is IBC like, or uh, if we can prove Tendermint consensus that we have IBC, uh, that, that's just the first step. Uh, obviously it's, it's better to prove the consensus of a chain or uh, rather than using a, a multi-sig. Um, but on top of the state layer, so like being able to bring state from one chain to the next, there exists a transport layer. So if you look at like the three layers of internet protocol, there's, a, there's an application layer, transport, and, and state. And this transport layer is the formulation, essentially the commitment produces a commitment to all of the data that's going in, in and out of the chain. So every all the data that the chain has received and all the data that the chain is, is trying to send. 
Uh, and for, from our perspective, that's what we want to standardize on across different chains. That way, a transport commitment produced by uh, Ethereum or produced on, on behalf of Ethereum uh, versus like an Ethereum rollup versus a uh, rollup on Celestia, whether it's a uh, s perhaps a, a subnet um, in, 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 uh, in Avalanche. Okay. And, yeah. Uh, so regardless of where these commitments are being produced from, uh, we want that to be uniform. And it, that's like, very similar to, to TCP. Like every node speaks TCP, regardless of whatever physical networking infrastructure you use. Um, you, every node speaks the same language. So with these ZK Light Client implementations, you probably have to program every type of chain separately, make different circuits for every type of uh, chain. So what are you guys kind of focusing on in, in the beginning? Is it Avalanche? Is it Ethereum? Like which, which chains are you targeting at first? We're targeting Ethereum. So starting with Ethereum L1 and expanding to Ethereum L2s and, and so on. Okay, Go going back to this concept of transport layer, application layer, and the analogy with HTTP for the application layer, TCP IP for the transport layer. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about what you mean by working and focusing on the, the transport layer. So if I understand well, the source chain is basically sending some kind of commitment to a target chain and it has to be verified by light clients. And I think that it is the job of relayers to pretty much check on both chains, whether like there's something that needs to, to happen or a message that needs to be passed. You are trying to standardize the archetype, like the structure, the the the, the way these these relayers do function and, and 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 process information. What is exactly going on, and what what are you trying to to do here at Polymer? Yes, so we're trying to standardize around like, what is transferred. Um, like the the transfer layer is a separation between like the how. The state layer is the how is something uh, transferred from one chain to the next. Uh, the transport commitment is, is the what. Uh, and, and in the what, it's essentially, I guess, in IBC terms, you have this standard spec around, well, we have this concept of connections, channels, and, and packets, and uh, uh, order channels, unordered channels, which are very similar to TCP and UDP. And you have these like canonical key paths that each of these commitments need to be written in. And then you can have a, a verification system that knows that, okay, these, this is a standard commitment scheme. Um, there's this uh, ICS-23 proving system on the... Um, on the IBC side where you can generalize Merkle tree form formats and essentially be able to prove in this tree uh, of, of different formats, like different types of data structures are supported, um, that uh, a key is in a canonical path or in a canonical location. So you have this like standardized verifier logic that you can then like add to any different chain so that that chain knows that if I'm getting a transport commitment in a format that I understand, TCP for example, I will know how to process this commitment. I will, I will be able to look in this commitment and identify all the messages and all the conversations that are going on. Um, and, and, that, and that's very important for, for true like, interoperability be between chains. All right. And the way you're trying to get these messages to travel from chain A to chain B involves some kind of hub. You are mm -hmm. working on some kind of polymer hub, which yes. would be some kind of, uh, yeah, like some hub and spoke model, some, some tower that redirects any payload, any packet from from uh, yeah from its source to, to to its target. Okay, I would I would love to know a little bit more about why you went for this design choice instead of just having sovereign systems like pinging each other or or, or or things like that. Is it to reduce overhead and bloat and use less communications and networking? Um, yeah, I, I would love to know a little bit more about that. So definitely to reduce the overhead of number of connections. Uh, the hub itself also serves to run a, I say like an IBC workload. We have this concept of transport layer separation. So Polymer Hub can separate the transport layer from the chain that is connected to it. Uh, we have this like virtual chain concept. And it's like internally this virtual IBC concept where we say that on behalf of Ethereum, Polymer Hub can produce a transport commitment. So now you have the separation of the idea of a state commitment and then the idea of a transport commitment. So the state commitment is committed to all the key value pairs written to the state of the chain. And a transport commitment is a commitment to all of the like in and out data, the networking data for a chain. Um, and I, I think like motivating the separation of the two is, is very important uh, because this leads itself into like uh, zero knowledge tech and how do you make this uh, whole system much more trust minimized. Uh, go ahead, Dan. So you mentioned uh, in a way it, that chain holds the, the state of the truth, what commitments have been made 
is part of that decision to use uh, blockchain as a database, which are not the most efficient forms of database. Um, like you could, some of this you could do just via peer to peer communication via like lib P2P. Mm -hmm. um, is part of the reason that you do that so you can actually slash um, actors if they don't perform their duty? Yes. Or yeah. It, yeah. Yes. Um, it's because in, in the short run, this hub needs to maintain a certain number of, like in the world where everything's ZK, and you can have like ZK, efficient ZK live clients for every chain consensus or execution. Obviously execution is even better. Um, and you can have the four choice rules of all these chains encoded in these like circuits. And you can have uh, all of the transport commitments, essentially like we, we call it proof of transport. So these like, ZK transport proofs also be computed from uh, some like state commitment derived from some state commitment on chain. And in this world where everything is ZK, technically you don't, you don't need a blockchain, um, but this is like long tail of like chains where you won't have efficient consensus algorithms that can be encoded into a circuit. Um, if you look at like even the Ethereum 2 like uh, Altair Light Client Committee, uh, the Sync Committee spec uh, encoded into a, a, a circuit, I think the Sync folks were at 100 million gates. Um, you get these like massive gates for, for, some, for some of these algorithms and that doesn't even capture the entire consensus of, of the Ethereum chain. Um, so that I, I think in, in, in the ideal world, you wouldn't need uh, a, a middle chain, but in the world where, you know, you have all these different chains, not everything can be converted eff eff effectively into a circuit. This middle hop can manage a number of different connection types on behalf of uh, other chains in this IBC network. So the idea is like, let's say you're bridging from Avalanche, just to make it easier, Avalanche to Ethereum. Do you actually submit the proof um, on to do verify the proof actually on the hub and then you go back out to a different spoke? Or do you actually submit the state of uh, Ethereum, for example, onto Avalanche, Avalanche onto Ethereum, and then you have to have the state of every connecting chain on each other? Oh, no, the, the, the hub will manage these. Uh, so in, in, term, in IBC yeah. terms, the hub will manage these IBC connections. So the hub will publish its consensus onto the chain that it's connected to, and then verify the consensus of a counterpart chain that is connected to and with multi-hop IBC. You can yeah. now hop over these like, multiple IBC connections uh, and have these yeah. IBC channels defined over them. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, that amortizes uh, the cost a, uh, a fair bit as well and the technical complexity. But but this does add a trust assumption on the middle hop. So the middle hop does become a bit of a, a weak link. Um, there, there's certain, uh, I would say, like guards you can use to, to help this. Uh, one of them being that uh, you, you can say, well, I can have maybe Babylon be like a third party, like checkpointing service where like perhaps um, if, if I'm going through a few middle hops, but the, the source and destination on the destination also has some, maybe it's using Babylon already for um, uh, fast withdrawals or fast unstaking um, or fast unbonding. And if you can then verify the, on the Babylon client, the source of this, the, the original chain so even if you're going through multiple hops using multi-hop IBC, you kind of have this like third-party checkpointing mechanism you can check as, a, as another source of truth uh, to, to increase the security. Um, we ha I haven't come up with a name for like this, I like, kind of, we're trying to come up with a spec for a conditional clients on the IBC side. So the ability for clients to express dependencies on, on each other. This is very key for modular blockchains. Um, and it, it can be good for security as well, since now you can have like multiple clients confirming a single us, us uh, a sort of multiple clients combining to com, uh, convey a, a source of truth. Okay. Okay. And how does this technology fit in this new like shared security parting, replicated security parting that we have lately uh, within the interchain, like all the, the Cosmos SDK based chains, and now even beyond with uh, with propositions like the ones on, from Eigenlayer? Yeah, so it, it fits pretty nicely. Uh, I think the ability to abstract clients at the state layer of IBC and like a lot of folks think of clients currently as only like clients that only represent consensus, but that's not necessarily true. You can have clients that represent an a, like attestation from eigenlayer restakers on some data for additional security. Um, you can have clients bond tokens even as to serve as like attestations for the consensus of a chain. So you can add additional security to some of these like IBC connections. Um, you can have clients that, you know, abstract different layers of the uh, modular blockchain stack, uh, which like rollups will inherit, inherit security from the data availability layer that they're on top of. Um, so in this model, you can have uh, 
connecting to a, a roll up on, a, on Celestia, you can have a IBC enabled chain run a client for Celestia, uh, potentially a client for the sequencer. If the sequencer is, if the rollup is not using Celestia for sequencing, and then also a client for the rollup itself. So you can have these like multiple clients that represent this, this single rollup. So you kind of get this, uh, you get the, in the connection itself, you do get security from uh, the data availability layer that the data availability layer provides for the, for the rollup. Okay. And for the community and people that are not necessarily familiar with your work at Polymer Labs and the implications of using such a solution to actually build a composable system or, um, I, I don't know, fetch data that is um, like interact with contracts that exist on other chains or send assets. What would be the, the differences in terms of I experience, cost, and the overall implications, the facility, to, the, the ease to build with a system like Polymer versus other non-canonical systems that are out there? Yeah, so I would say that building with us is the same as building with IBC uh, yeah. in, in general. Although to be transparent, uh, building on top of IBC is, is not entirely smooth. I think we're still working through a lot of, uh, I would say like VM to IBC integrations that are not consistent across different chains. Even if you look at all the EVM chains in the Cosmos, um, they tend to not have the same integration um, and they tend to go about the integration in different ways. So I think the, a, a big push this year is gonna be standardizing on the way IBC is integrated into the different virtual machines Starting within the Cosmos, obviously, when we activate the um, IBC outside of the Cosmos on those virtual machines as well, and we want to be able to have people, we want people to be able to have a unified experience building across these different chains. So I would okay. say that building on top of us is similar to building on top of IBC. Well, the goal of Palmer is not to make uh, the dev experience better, but to make it easier to integrate IBC into these other chains and to also improve uh, other things like performance uh, and, and trust minimization in, in the long term, et cetera. So uh, from a security point of view, like, I like us being upfront and forwards about the security of bridges because we do need cross-chain bridges and uh, IBC is one of the, like genuinely one of the mo more elegant designs that I've seen. But then some new sort of like bottles open up when you go cross-chain between consensus mechanisms as well. So for example, like you can you can bridge fairly uh, uh, safely from Cosmos to Ethereum because it natively supports light clients. But then we're kind of jury rigging light clients for other chains <laughs> using ZK, right? So, so from the ETH side, um, do you guys use the sync sync committee? And for the listeners, essentially, to for clients to be able to essentially sync to the latest block quicker. They have this 500 person committee or 500 randomly selected validators that perform this role for 27 hours. Um, and, but one of the, one of the sort of bad things on that is there is no punishment if they're dishonest. Right. And, and I know if you guys are running a ZK circuit, you're not going to be verifying the entire consensus of, of every single epoch, right. That would be computationally really hard. So, I'm curious to know your opinion, like as, as a slight rebuttal or just building on what Jane Prestowich from Nomad said, of how big of a problem do you think it would be with sync committee collusion? How much security assumptions does that add to uh, trustlessly sending messages from Ethereum to Cosmos or trustlessly bridging funds? Yeah, so uh, James actually makes a good point. Um, there, there is a lot of issues with the sync committee. It's not perfect. Um, it, it is bearish on some of these uh, ZK light client uh, solutions. I feel like people seem to take ZK for meaning that it's completely trustless. I, like, <laughs> like the general community seems to have this like, oh, if it's ZK, then then we've solved the bridging problem. This is this is completely trustless, which like obviously is not true. It's it's, it's at best trust minimized. Mm -hmm. But in, in the Ethereum case, yeah, it's not accurately representing Ethereum consensus. Um, there, there are. Uh, the, the security of the, this model is is not as nearly as high as as um, as as like in, uh, James made it clear in his article. Um, however, there there is some things to consider in the defense of this uh, ALC. So, one thing to consider is that uh, although the sync committee signatures can be are sourced from this like five twelve um, I guess randomly elected uh, validator set, the it's the block proposer that has the authority to. Uh, actually decide whether or not to include these attestations uh, in the block that they're producing. 
So you can imagine if when a, if a block producer is proposing a new block, um, it gets some like garbage that's signed by these like scene committee uh, signers. It's just going to say like, I don't know what this is. I try to verify this, but like this doesn't make any sense to me. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to drop that. Um, obviously, there's like a chance for collusion still. Um, but now the now you can say that like, yeah, the block proposer is uh, going to be penalized for for for, for signing something that, that is that is invalid. Um, additionally, you can say that uh, block proposals also changes over time so that uh, even if there were some like short term collusion, it would be very hard to maintain this collusion for a large number of blocks. Um, and also after we get to two justifications, we will get the finalized view and, and these uh, like malicious blocks or malicious forks that were produced uh, in the light client view would, would be forked out if, if, if the light client view were colluding with uh, some of these block proposers to, to, to sign some of these uh, or produce headers with some of these uh, malicious sync committee attestations. Okay. If you guys have a way, I'm, I'm just curious, like on a general point of view of then essentially you'd have to wait a certain amount of blocks to increase the probability of uh, the proposers not being able to also um, censor valid attestations or create invalid ones, right? So the longer you wait essentially for block confirmations, the less of a problem that that security assumptions, majority security assumption with the sync committee would be. Do you like, do you guys have, um, have you guys thought through of a way to essentially you make a proof of a state at X block and then you have to reprove X blocks later that that hasn't been reorged or changed? Actually, actually we, we run a, um, we run the light client code for Ethereum natively. So we, we don't run it in a circuit. Um, what, what we do is uh, we, we track all the forks uh, in, internally to Polymer. The, the guarantees of Polymer going from Ethereum into uh, any into the IBC network is that we're just going to track Ethereum consensus to the to the best that we can. Um, if if you want to relay at a lower latency, you're taking on risk, and, and then we'll be very clear with with those risks. Um, and you can also like if you look at the Polymer network, you you can see all the forks that are all the active forks that are happening below the finalization period. So what you want to do, I guess. Uh, it, using like an example here. So if you were to do token transfers, so ICS 20 token transfers, you're gonna to want to wait for finalized or quote unquote finalized Ethereum blocks. So you would establish an IBC connection between Ethereum and Polymer that says, this connection only accepts finalized Ethereum headers so that uh, you'll have a, I would say like a, a limited, a, a minimum latency of 12 to 18 minutes roughly. It's 70 this, blocks if I remember right, or was it 90? Yeah, it, it's it's. I think it's a, a few epochs, a few epochs, I believe. Um, but yeah, it's 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 some it's some number of. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Um, but ultimately, you, you can get this. Uh, I believe it's at least a, a third of Ethereum. A third of Ethereum stake would get slashed uh, if this condition were violated. So, like, if this finalized block were actually not finalized or reordered out, then a third of Ethereum stake would get slashed, which is a pretty high level of economic security. So you would do token transfers over this very secure IBC connection. And, and you'll know that I have a pretty good guarantee that these token transfers would not get reverted or reworked out. Or... And then for some ephemeral, ephemeral transactions that maybe are also like low value, uh, an, an IBC application can elect to use a connection that has, has lower latency, so better uh, user, user experience, and, uh, but also has some risk that the application is willing to take on. Okay, so you have to set some some predicates, some some parameters uh, based on the, the the value of the transaction. Yes, yes, yeah. um, and you can okay. think of this concept even on. So we're bridging from uh, Ethereum, which has like a not single non single slot finality. You can think of this concept too with bridging rollups. Since the most secure way to bridge rollups will be to wait for a settlement on the L1, verify the L1 that the L1 header has has finalized. And then bridge from that from that roll up onwards, and you have this like really long like fraud window that you have to wait for and and, and, and such. And if you, if you want to do it at lower latency, you can configure uh, on the IBC side optimistic IBC connections with different uh, levels, different fraud windows, and also like you can include uh, dependencies between clients to allow like soft confirmations from a sequencer, soft confirmations from a third party, um, and there's all these different mo security models that you can play with within the context of IBC. Transaction data or state diffs actually submitted on chain is a harder level as well. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And in regards to uh, adapting IBC to more environments and to to rollups, I think that you've recently 
announced that you're working on something with, with Celestia to provide a solution to open up like disenclave decent, decent um, ro roll-ups from, uh, from, from themselves, if that actually makes sense. Could you tell us a little bit more about your agenda on that aspect? <laughs> Yeah, so this is just general open source IBC work. Um, it's, uh, I guess, like some of the conditional client stuff that I was talking about uh, up until this point where in order for uh, IBC enabled chain to uh, confidently speak to a rollup on Celestia, they need to be convinced of a few things. They need to be convinced of the proof of a few things. They need proof of data availability. Uh, they need proof of transaction ordering, um, essentially like a proof of like a four choice rule. And you also need proof of execution. So you would source these three proofs from different places. Potentially, you could be running a uh, tenement yeah. like for the Celestia network that has proof of data availability. So now you know that the data has been made available. I can now open a fraud window because if the data hasn't been made available uh, and you start the fraud window, uh, you may, people, uh, people may, fraud provers may not be able to generate fraud proofs if they can't ac access the actual data. So now you open this fraud window um, and then you're looking to the, uh, the the sequencer or whatever one is producing this uh, proof of transaction ordering, proof of the fourth choice rule as the canonical block. Um, and then you're looking to the execution environment uh, for the proof of the exit, the state transition was correct. And that it, in the case that it's not, you would get a re-execution, you would get this fraud proof that essentially identifies a single transaction within the block that executed, uh, that was that was malicious. And this gets supplied to the, the uh, proof of execution client or the optimistic IBC client on this IBC chain. And then you would uh, execute this fraud proof, uh, be convinced that this state transition was invalid and then just revoke that header or th whatever the chain decides to do. Sometimes you would freeze the client itself. Uh, in some cases you would just drop the header. Very exciting. And so you're mentioning that this is just public source work that is uh, that has been like going on over the last few weeks. It is totally checkable and people can also contribute to to this, I, I wanted to get back to Polymer's agenda and when we can expect to actually see this system reaching uh, production. And um, instead of asking one token, I'll just be asking one white paper as I <laughs> didn't manage to find one yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently in the process of writing the white paper with some of our engineers. Uh, and where... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, we, we're using, uh, it's secret in GPT-5. <laughs> we got we got we got beta access. It's 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 the white paper edition. Uh, we just created a bunch of crypto white papers, and it's and it's also writing ours. Um, so so we're we're in the process of writing the paper. Uh, probably release that close to around testnet, but likely we'll release it um, in I guess a uh, in, in waves. Probably like our closest investors first, and and, and then so and then outwards from there. Um, but uh, but yeah, like I think I'm around like thirty pages in, and I'm not anywhere near finished with the paper. There's a lot of ground to cover internally. Um, un unfortunately, I I've been trying to be very succinct in all the different sections. Um, succinct is kind of, okay. Yeah, um, yeah I, was, I was waiting <laughs> for that. that <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we're looking to launch testnet uh, in the middle of this year. Um, and we're looking to launch mainnet uh, hopefully in this year or early next year. Um, and uh, ho also hoping that when the white paper comes out, it'll be a lot more clear, like exactly what we're doing, what the architecture is, uh, wh why we think it makes sense. And in this paper, can we expect you to cover how you make um, such a system economically viable, the whole game theory behind it and the model to, mm -hmm. to, make, um, to make this yeah, viable? Yeah, we'll have a, a I guess like a, a tokenomic section, but I, I would say that the expected workload on top of Polymer is mostly going to be on the in, in the form of uh, verification of the consensus of other chains. The computing transport commitments is not as computationally expensive. Uh, it's mostly running a light client. So like the more IBC connections that uh, our chain has, the the more compute de demand that there will be. Okay, and that's the the, the the whole economy. So you're 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 paying for the, the computation to to verify um, yeah the consensus and there's also this whole, uh, yeah, m m message passing kind of relayer form of like activity running a light, light client, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, I, I wanted to also mention that there's on, on top of that, there's this idea, and then like there's something that's not, um, I believe it's not properly handled uh, in in any uh, interop in any interop protocol, um, and and what I'm talking about right now is kind of like a, a self-contained ecosystem for incentivization. 
Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm under the impression that a lot of these, uh, I'll say like, you know, our protocols, they have incentivization models where like, maybe it's just like for the app transfer, like usually has some like token bridge that they build. And just for this token bridge uh, and this, this, this like, token transfer systems, they'll be able to like, take some fees. That's not generalizable to interop in, in general. With interop, you have a, a few different costs. You have the cost of relaying a packet, which, which would be like posting the packet on their chain and, and relaying this packet across. But you also have the cost of uh, client updates. Whether the client update is in the form of like a single Oracle or it, it's in the form of, the, of a proof of consensus, regardless of the actual proof, there's a cost to doing the client update as well. Uh, IBC has a specification, ICS 29, for specifying fee payments for packets and how, to, how this can be incentivized in a trustless way uh, like to allow like relayers to register accounts at the application layer of IBC and also be able to take fees there. It doesn't account for client updates. So we're working on a uh, specification for client update incentivization that would allow this whole thing to become a, a enclosed loop. So right now, um, for anyone that runs like validators or infrastructure in, in IBC, they know that uh, they generally are running relayers at cost, at least for the client updates. Um, it's it's not ideal. Maybe you get a grant. So generally, people don't run these relayers uh, if they don't get a grant from uh, a particular chain to say like, you oh yeah, the community pool. You can just yeah, ask the community pool. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, like that's very manual and, and it's not ideal. But we want to create turn this into a self enclosed economy where there's some like game theory around like, oh well, if I want to relay a packet faster. I can incentivize a client update now. So like if, if I inject into like the incentives pool for this client update, like X, like X amount of uh, tokens, I can guarantee that my packet gets relayed immediately. That's like, I'm, I'm desperate. Like I'm, I'm, I need to get this packet across. If I don't care about this latency and, I, and I'm willing to wait a little bit, uh, I can also wait for the, I can, I can add some incentives and then wait for the update to take uh, a little bit longer. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, if, if I'm only supplying a little bit of incentive, I probably have to wait for like a bunch of different packets to be queued up and, and have these uh, incentives trickle down to the point that it actually makes sense for a relayer to, 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 re to relay this, this client update. Um, you can also imagine that this actually makes it really interesting for, for client level providers. So like these like state providers of like how to bring state from one chain to, to the next, they all have different cost models, different cost models, different security models. Once you have this incentiv incentivization layer on top that's standardized, what you'll have is this like economy of like different like client providers be like, oh yeah, use our service. Like, like these are our trust assumptions that they, you, you, you will have using us. And these are our costs. And maybe some, some, some can even charge like higher fees than, than others. Because uh, like, as a client provider, you can also, you would also be able to charge fees. But you can say that you have this like economy where there's like a lot of competing client level providers for uh, different connections. And if there's no like rewards, there's no incentives there, there's, there's no incentives for them to, to, to compete there. Uh, but now you have this like really interesting like like these market dynamics happening um, w without like the needing of like a community pool or like these like, very like manual mechanisms. And just from a economic sort of sustainability standpoint of view too, I'm curious. Um, I remember reading the the zk IBC ETH research post by um, I think it's Garvit, right? <laughs> Electron Labs, something. And I'm I'm, I'm curious like how. How similar is your cost structure of uh, proving a like client to what they essentially proposed in that? What I'm what I'm trying to ask is like, how much would it cost to send a packet or do to do a token transfer from, let's say Ethereum to Cosmos? How much overhead that does that add for costs? Yeah. So there's the cost of the client update, which which is expensive. Uh, you're, you're looking at roughly three hundred thousand gas on chain if you have a, a relatively efficient verifier. So like. Regardless of the original proof, you you now have some sort of like Roth 16 proof that you're ultimately uh, verifying on chain. And then you have the cost of the prover. Um, generally, and then this is kind of hand wavy because I feel like in a lot of ZK systems, they don't account for prover costs. Like the economics of the system don't really like cover a prover cost as well. But in, in, in inherently, like the prover needs to, like any prover work done needs to also get paid, whether it's through some like open proof market. Uh, whether it's the actual computation run by the relayer. For us, we can actually run it in a relayer because we have a very small circuit for, for our consensus. Uh, but regardless, like th the prover cost must be accounted for. Uh, and then you have the cost of relaying the packet itself. So like the, these, these, these three different costs. Um, but, but I'll kind of stop there to say that a lot of people think that ZKIBC means 
like a ZK tenement light client. Um, IBC is agnostic to the consensus of the client layer. Uh, and ZK IBC does not mean like a, a ZK, like IBC light client. Um, to us, the ZK IBC means uh, the ZK of the transport protocol. So the if you ZK the IBC transport protocol, you get these like uh, transport proofs that, that we'll uh, discuss in our paper. And then you'll be able to like be able to tr tr in a trust minimized way, generate these transport commitments on behalf of the chain. Um, that, that's what we think ZK IBC is. Um, but, but back to the, the cost structure of a relaying a packet to, to Ethereum, if you were to do it directly with uh, default tenement consensus, uh, you're, you're looking at, uh, if you do a nightly deal on chain without ZK, 26 million gas. If you make a bunch of optimizations in terms of the signature scheme used um, and, and other things, then you can potentially get that down to around 8 million gas. If you then uh, you know, implement this whole thing in a circuit, you can get down to a verification cost of 300,000 gas. Um, mm -hmm. Also in, in what uh, Garvey had proposed in the uh, ETH research forum is just for signature verification. It doesn't even include the rest of the tournament like client algorithm. They're already at these like really long prover times in this like massive circuit just for verifying EV25519 signatures. So like you're, you're to our like client algorithm also covers the rest of the uh, tenement like client algorithm. So signature verification is actually only a fraction of the total cost of verifying the tenement like client algorithm. I think it's roughly around 10 to 20% of the cost. I, I may be a little bit off my numbers there, but there's like 80% of the cost of the algorithm that's not accounted for. So when we realized it would, if we were to convert this algorithm naively into a circuit, we get this massive circuit and these prover times that don't make any sense. Um, so we decided, okay, how, what if we were to optimize the header production or like create a consensus engine that can produce headers for different execution targets? So that was the idea of ZK Mint. We were like thinking that as a transport hub and we're connecting to a lot of different chains, a lot of different execution environments, uh, perhaps like in in uh, in one environment, like one snark scheme would make sense. In another environment, a different scheme would make sense. Um, in in one environment, they have X Y Z precompiles. In this other environment, they have like you know a, a different set of precompiles or like different set of optimizations that you, that you can leverage. Um, and then you can have this like uh, multi signature consensus engine that can generate these headers that are optimized for various execution targets. So what what, what we were able to do for verifying tenement consensus on Ethereum is that we were to generate this really efficient circuit. So we made a number of optimizations. Uh, we only have 500,000 gates for our circuit. So we're actually able to, to run a prover inside a relayer if you wanted to. We also have a proving service, but like if, if, if someone were to want to, they could be able to run this prover on commodity hardware. So like a, a reasonably sized cloud instance, not like, like without hardware acceleration and be able to generate proofs uh, on, the, on the order of seconds. Um, and if they were to use hardware acceleration, obviously it's even faster, but they're not required to. And like this kind of brings down the prover cost to something that's reasonable um, and, and also wouldn't add like too much cost to the uh, publishing or the verification of the uh, the client update already on chain, which would be around 300k gas. Okay, and what type of proofs and primitives are you using in that in, in, in that scheme? Right now we're using Groth. So we have a similar to, uh, I would say, um, like succinct, we have, we have a Groth 16 circuit for the, the full tenement light client algorithm. Uh, we've implemented it for the non-adjacent header verification algorithm so that we can lazily submit headers. Uh, there's a, there's two tenement light client algorithms. There's uh, one for adjacent header verification. There's one for non-adjacent header verification. Um, there's some internal details around like unbonding periods and like things you need to check um, for like uh, it's an attack you need to check against. Uh, but but in the light client algorithm, the non-adjacent ones gives us nicer UX since like now we can like only lazily relay within some like time period. We have to relay at some point because um, if you don't keep the client up to date, it'll go it'll grow stale. Um, but we're allowed to uh, publish headers at a lower frequency, which improves the performance as well, or the, or the overall cost. Okay, okay. And if I understood well, you basically need to go again with some custom optimizations and adapt depending on the environment that you're targeting and based on the curves that you have there and the, the different like parameters <laughs> that you have. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the other thing that I'll mention is that uh, we, we also have another project called, called ZK Tree. So internally we've incubated I guess like two different, I don't really consider ZK Mint a, a ZK project, even though it has ZK, it's, it's useful. <laughs> In the <my> name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I renamed my name to ZK Sam just during the podcast, yeah, yeah. just 
I like to add some value. <laughs> nice, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, like I consider it more of a consensus related project, um, but uh, it, it has a nice ZK related result. <laughs> um, <laughs> with, with ZK tree, it, it's more in the ZK domain where it's a um, essentially a formalization around how to recursively com uh, compose pr proofs together of different types of different schemes in, into a tree format. We've, we've published a, a paper on this. And, and the idea there is that we want to optimize for verification costs on chain. The idea is that if you can share the verification costs on chain with a variety of use cases, uh, like my, my thinking goes along the lines of like a, a shared sequencer for ZK proofs. Like we have, there's like so much talk going on about like shared sequencers for uh, rollups. Uh, there's not as much talk about shared sequencing for ZK proofs, uh, which you know would love to, I guess, like start that conversation now. But the idea is that if at the at the um, on the leaf nodes of the zk tree, if you were able to include like cross sixteen proofs, uh, Planck proofs, or various flavors of Planck proofs, so with Planck with every Planck with a different set of custom gates is technically a, a new construction or or a, a different construction because it changes the the, the scheme and and the, and the prover and the verifier, and um, you can also have these other constructions as well at the base layer of this tree then perhaps like we could share verification costs with um, perhaps even some of our competitors. Like the, all these like different ZK competitors could potentially share uh, verification costs because like uh, it's, it's all different use cases. Uh, you can you, you, uh, verifying the root proof of this tree of proofs on chain makes it so that you're able to verify all these proofs in, in one go. Um, yeah, and you amortize all of them into just one verification and you can do that off chain as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And the, like the proofs, if you if you look at the construction or like linked together, we're, we're hashing the circuits of uh, ch children nodes of the tree um, with the in public inputs of uh, as well together uh, in the parent node, so that we create this kind of like uh, linked list structure of uh, cryptographic commitments to the public in, ins and outs and the actual circuits that we're proving um, to kind of build this relationship uh, across this 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 tree. This is actually zk tree that. That's not to be like mixed up with ZK Mint. Yeah, these are two separate things. Um, yeah, and all this is actually it's actually one of your open source initiatives that you're maintaining at Polymer, right? Yeah, it's open source. Uh, we've instantiated so ZK Tree can be instantiated with any ZK construction. It's just like a generalization around this data structure. Yeah. Um, it, it looks like a tree. Um, it it also like produces like a Merkle commitment, but it can be instantiated using uh, any any type of scheme, whether it's Plonky two. Uh, I can imagine it being possible with Halo 2. I can imagine it being possible with Nova, um, with, with a lot of these different schemes. We've instantiated with Plunky 2. We're also exploring uh, Nova as well right now. Um, but the first pass, uh, the, core, the, the code is open source. So um, the people that are interested in Plunky 2 and ZK Tree can take a look. Wonderful. And so, of course, we can contribute to it as it's open source. But I also believe that there are some maybe some vacancies and ways to get involved at Polymer Labs. Yeah, so we're working on supporting different proof types in Plonky 2 right now um, yeah. in terms of the, the leaf proofs of ZK tree. So um, yeah, so so like if, if you know people, folks are interested in collaborating on that, um, we're, we're open to, uh, our, our ZK researchers are open to collaboration. Amazing. I think that we've been covering quite a few aspects of uh, the Polymer stack. Is there anything that we're missing? Some alpha, something that we didn't cover, something that's coming up soon, uh, Bo? Yeah, I, I guess like not anything specific. Um, I, I guess uh, maybe some just like high level things about like how to think about Polymer um, might be helpful for viewers. Like we, we're trying to push the idea in our paper of, uh, and I, I guess I've spoken a little bit about it, like this idea of like, what is the transport layer of NROM? Uh, what, what, what does transport se layer separation mean? What's a transport uh, commitment and what is a transport proof? So to, de to define all these three in, in one go, I would say that the, the transport layer is the, the data that's the networking data that's going in and out of a chain. Um, and the transport commitment is how do you commit to all that data that's going in and out of the chain? And the proof or the transport proof is how do you prove that that commitment was uh, computed properly? So the long-term vision for Polymer is that it, it is an IBC hub that can do all these, these three things in one which is one, it can separate the transport layer workload from the chain itself. It can produce a transport commitment uh, on behalf of that chain. And then it, it can also generate a transport proof that that commitment was generated properly. 
And this, all of these things are tied together and it needs to sit on top of a provable like client layer as well, because if you can't prove the state transitions of a chain, you can't prove other things as well. So that's the first step. Um, like, like ZK Min is in that direction. Um, even though the work that a lot of these other uh, ZK organizations around Interop is also helpful there as well. Um, so like all these things are connected. Uh, and if you look at the big picture, it's how do we make IBC like very generalizable, easy to integrate, and also as trust minimized as possible. Okay, I like to see it as some kind of post office with anti-tempering stickers uh, to basically prove that the actual packets are properly sealed and are <laughs> packed with integrity. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so like when, when on, on the like the long-term vision is that when a source chain receives a message, the proof that they receive as well will be proving that the, con the uh, consensus or the execution of the chain of the sender, it'll be it'll prove the uh, that the transport commitment made behalf on all the like IBC related events emitted on the sending chain was done properly. Uh, and then you can have this like kind of like proving that the state, proving of the state transition, proving of all of the data in, like in and out um, all in one uh, when, when the, when the uh, receiver chain re receives this. Pretty exciting. And I yeah, think it's, that's it's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that wraps up that, that, that episode. And I would like to thank both of you again for, for coming on the show. Really appreciate your time and your expertise. And as usual, I'll be leaving all the relevant links in the, in the description if you guys want to connect with the Polymer Labs team, the Discord links, all the documentation and all the references, um, all the documents that we've been quoting during the podcast will be, uh, will be down there. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Daniel, Bo, uh, it's really been a pleasure to have you on the show. And Again, if you have anything to add, please, you're welcome to do so. Otherwise, we'll probably get to, to do a, a checkup in a few months once uh, Polymer reaches a new, a new level of, the, of its roadmap. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to come back again once we've, uh, we have a white paper ready so that there's... Please. Yeah, it's, 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 it's... <laughs> I have binge reading now. I'll spend the next three weeks sitting through your 130-page white paper. Oh, I hope, it, I hope it's not that long. It's going to take me <laughs> Thank you.